morning, everybody. The sun has gone down here and it has risen there where you are. You are one day ahead of me. I am so happy to join all of you. You guys are radical, transformational kingdom uh, ambassadors over in the Philippines. And I have much expectation for you at advancing the kingdom uh, in the Philippines. And uh, we are doing it here where we are. And I, I love hearing the reports from what you are doing. This message of the kingdom is bringing transformation all over the world, especially during times of crisis. I do not consider this a time of crisis, but the world does. And so that is when uh, the kingdom values principles are tested, right? That's when they are manifested under pressure with crisis. That's when they are manifested in society. So today I would like to talk about uh, kingdom mandate and understanding the kingdom influence. Um, as you all know, our flagship scripture, Genesis 1:26, and God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, his nature, and let them have dominion over everything in the earth. So man was created to influence and rule the earth with the nature of God. He gave us his image, his character before he gave us dominion power. So image has nothing to do with looking like God. It has a Hebrew word that has to do with his nature, his essence, his spirit. It is his character is your true nature of a thing, of a person. So every God-given gift that he has given you will be manifested when, and that is how you are influencing in your community with your gift. But you must remember when, when we have dominion in our area of gifting, which is our leadership ability, our rulership responsibility, we were given character first, the nature of God in order to rule here on earth as a representative for him. So I want to discuss some key points when it comes to influencing. And this is on a personal level. Now, when Dr. Miles would ask me to speak, he'd always let me talk, speak on influence. He would always give me subject topics of influence, how to influence in business, how to influence for the kingdom of God. So it's no surprise that my mentorship program is called the School of Influence, because that is our responsibility as kingdom citizens to influence the kingdom of God through the manifestation of it in our life as a witness and testimony to all nations. But it first starts with our neighbors. It first starts in the workplace. Transformation first starts with transforming our own mindset and then change can be implemented from your change. So the number one point that I would like to expound on, it's very important that you are genuine. And there are many facets of being genuine that I would like to emphasize. It is having no ulterior motives. People are used to other people having ulterior motives. Everyone's trying to sell me something. Everyone's trying to get my money. Everyone's in it for themselves. So this gives you credibility when people realize you have no ulterior motives except to be the friend or to exemplify love to them, to show kindness to them. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he saw Nathaniel and he said, truly, this is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In other words, he is a man with complete integrity. This is what gives you credibility in your community, is integrity. In other words, when Jesus used the word, he has no guile, that word means he is not cunning. 
He, he doesn't have any ulterior motives. He's not sly. He's not being my friend because he wants something from me. He's not in it for himself. So people can sense if you are genuine. And I believe this is really key. And another word I'd like to add here is humility. Humility is not a word that uh, people can use you, step all over you. It's what they referred to Jesus. He was humble. Now, humble means earthy. That's what that word means, down to earth. They said, this man has so much knowledge, revelation. Like they were astounded, but yet he's so down to earth. He looks at me and treats me like I'm a human being, not that he doesn't look down on me. And so they recognize Jesus operated with humility. And remember, he was humble, earthy, grounded. When you know who you are and you have confidence in who you are, that grounds you. Insecure people are not grounded. <laughs> uh, you can tell their insecurities or you can tell when somebody is insecure about themselves. And they always need the accolades of other people to make them feel like they are worthy or have worth. But when you're genuine and when you have a sense of purpose and you are grounded in your identity, people are attracted to that. You see a lot of inauthentic uh, people on social media, right? I don't know about you, but here in America, they, they rent little pods. So it looks like you're on a jet or they, they stage the area. So it looks like you're in a mansion or, you know, these elaborate places. So there's a lot of inauthentic out there. There's a lot of ingenuine people. A lot of people don't know who they are, don't know why they are here and don't have a clue where they're going in life. So when you exemplify the opposite of being genuine with a sense of purpose, being grounded in who you are, people respond to that. So I don't want you to take that lightly. And the next slide is having a pure heart that goes with genuine. People can trust you. They can confide in you. And I think this is one very important thing that I wonder, I hear of people in leadership, whether it's in church or in government or in civic society, mishandling resources, mishandling finances. The people don't trust them. Now, listen, I heard your pastor saying it takes people to make vision happen. It takes resources to make people happen. It takes time, money, energy for visions to happen. Can God trust you with money? Can God trust you with people and resources? Or will you squander it on yourselves? That's where being genuine comes into play and having a pure heart. Jesus noted Nathaniel. Here, I have never seen a man in all... Israel, but Nathaniel, a man with no deceit, a man of complete integrity. Do you know that the Hebrew word for God to describe God, the closest word they can come up with to describe him is one, meaning the number one. He is all in one and one within himself. And he is so pure, he's integrated in himself. Integrity comes from who you are and what you say and what you do are the same thing. Integrated. You are fully integrated with yourself. There is not a dichotomy. There is not hypocrisy. So God, the, 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 it's so hard for them to define God. Because remember in Hebrew, a name 
is not a name, it's a description of a being or a person or a thing. So Yahweh, one, all in one. Remember, God is self-sustaining. He wasn't sourced. Nothing sourced him. Everything else on earth is sourced from something. So it's hard for us to comprehend. But he's so pure and of character. And that is how we are to be because we are created in his nature, his likeness, and his being. And we have the ability to be just like daddy. Now you will stand out in the crowd when you operate from a genuine place and with a pure heart. Secondly, the key to being influential is vision. Knowing what you were sent here to accomplish. I look at Nehemiah, who was busy building a wall. And the people came and they said, we want to have a meeting with you. We want to talk to you. He said, if I come down to talk to you and come to this meeting, then who will build the wall? I'm busy with my vision. <laughs> Don't distract me. That is infectious. It's inspiring. We love movies where people are so driven by their vision. And there's one thing they want to accomplish in life. You become very narrow-minded. You ignore all things that you could be doing. All things that society tell you to do by doing what you should be doing, what you were born to do. And that's where vision comes in. Jesus said in Luke 10, only a few things in life are necessary. You should be able to recognize what those few things in life are that are necessary for your existence. What does that look like? I know exactly what that looks like because I have narrowed it down. My vision is so clear and it's very simple. It's simplified. So it's important you execute your vision and you accomplish your vision, your purpose in your unique way. Do not compare yourself to others. Do not compare yourself to what they're doing. You can only compare yourself to yourself according to your, the progress, progression of your vision. And every year that goes by, you should be able to quantify the progress in your vision every year because the years are going by faster and faster aren't they, as we age? Number three, and I've learned this from my husband. This is him on the right in the, in the blue shirt with the stripes. That is Matthew. Cultivate relationships. Meet with leaders in your community. Have you guys ever heard of Sony Records? Well, this gentleman he's playing golf with, this was probably 14, eight, nine years ago was the CEO, the second in command at Sony Records. He discovered Beyonce and knows her well. He discovered, he managed Aerosmith. He managed Bruce Springsteen. He managed, uh, there's so many names, uh, Jennifer Lopez, J-Lo. He, he knows them, man, we're friends with him. He's no longer the CEO of Sony Records, but we are not, um, intimidated by them because we cultivate relationships. And that's one of the key to influencing is cultivating relationships. He said, Jesus said, go into all the systems and impact them with kingdom principles and with the character and the culture of the kingdom. Don't just uh, commune with your religious friends or those in your own community. You need to branch out, invite other people to dinner. Invite them out for coffee. There's a lot of lonely people out there and just become their friends just for the sake of being their friends. That was the secret of Dr. Miles Monroe. That's why the prime ministers of the nations called him for consultation. When I traveled with him, I sat there and I saw his goal was to become their friend not to impress them with how much he knew. And he knew a lot, a lot. 
but his goal was to become their friends. You win them first as friends because a wise man wins souls, their mind, their friendship. Then they can trust you and confide in you. And then they'll ask you, how do I get into the kingdom? How do I come to know Jesus? Okay. So this next scripture, there was a rich man from Arthmelia, Arimathea, named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus's body and Pilate ordered it be given into him. So Joseph here followed Jesus and obeyed his principles and then took care, care of things when he needed it. And Joseph had influence in the government of Caesar. And I know there's people in your community that have influence in the governments. And this is key. You cultivate those relationships. And Mark 15, the women took care of Jesus's needs. Key number four, your gift. Become a cultivator, a specialist. Hone your craft. And Dr. Miles would say, when your gift is perfected, it becomes its own attraction. That's why we love watching shows like, um, what's the big show? Uh, the talent, the big talent shows. Uh, we love watching The Voice. We love watching um, Who's Got Talent. We love watching people with their giftings. It's its own attraction. So there's value in specializing in your gift. And again, this principle is key. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of kings and great people. Now, David was a skilled slinger. That was his skill. So use your gift, your business, your resources to influence people and ultimately transform communities with kingdom principles. Right now, I am using our resources here in Naples to help somebody campaigning that is going into government. I'm actually mentoring her in the process. So use things to get the right people in positions, support them, encourage them. Because of David's gift, he was a great influencer of Israel and eventually became king because he honed his gift, his skill as a slinger. He practiced it. Now, you can have a gift that is given by God, but your responsibility is to develop it, practice it. That is your responsibility. Refine it, hone it. Okay, the next few slides, I, I put pictures of my husband's work on here as an architect. We started the firm 11 years ago. We have eight regional offices and over 60 employees. We have many resources now that we utilize to advance the kingdom of God. Our success is just absolutely immeasurable in a decade. It's amazing. And because of the success of my husband and his gift, this is his gifting as design. He's totally recreated. You can go to the next slide. He does big projects. This is an older one, but he does many, many big projects. I didn't have time to put the newest projects on. He does a lot of commercial projects. If you go to the next slide, they, they write articles about him, that Matthew is creating the new old Naples. So because of my husband's gift, he's creating a different culture and it's made him a great influencer in our city. And it has gone beyond. We have been able to meet with our governor because of my husband's influence. The mayor calls Matthew for advice every now and then when it comes to areas of his gifting. So our responsibility is to subdue the market with our gift. We control the market. You know you're gifted if people are uh, imitating you or knocking off your gift, as they say. You know what imitation purses are? Vuitton, Gucci, and they have knockoffs from China, right? Well, you know it's a great product if they're knocking it off. So we see other architects trying to do how Matthew does because Matthew 
is so sought after with his gifting. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. It's, it's hard to quantify, but he's growing. And then with the growth, you have to manage and hire the right people and hire the right managers for the offices. So it's quite a bit, but as we grow, he's managing it. At times in the beginning, you have to give it away for free. We did the city park. We did the dog park. Here in America, people love their dogs and they act like they're their children. So he did this work for free. Actually, in the paper there, you can see some of his work in the park down below in that lower photo. So your influence and your gift team can get the attention of other influencers and entrepreneurs. The next slide. So we must develop our skill. And this is what I was referring to. There's a scripture in Samuel, 1 Samuel. From that time, the spirit of God came upon David when he was anointed to be king. Remember, he was a young boy. He's around 13, 14, 15 years old. And he began to show signs of becoming great. But what did he do? He knew he was going to be king, but he went back to the responsibility of tending his father's sheep around Bethlehem, but God was with him. A lot of times we know what we're born to do. We start doing it. People start seeing the greatness and then we get a big head and we think, oh, I've come into my own. I need to open a big office. I need to do all these big things. I need to get on social media and do all this. But we need to come back, refine our gift, develop and work on our relationship with God, get a strategy. And we need to go through the process. It is so key to go through the process. What happened when Adam did not go through the process of development as a child? He failed his first temptation. So when Jesus came back to earth, he had to go through the process of learning discipline and developing as a child and being obedient to his parents to go through the process and wait 30 years before he initiated the vision. And even then, God himself had to test his son in the desert with the temptations that we all face. So we have to go through the process of development, developing our character, learning from our mistakes, operating with obedience. So here, David, what did he do when he went back to his sheep and his father's pastures? All alone, all, all day, he practiced throwing stones in a sling until he could strike exactly the place where he aimed. When he swung his sling, he knew that the stone would go to the very spot for which he intended. So he practiced his, his gift. He was anointed to be king, but he submitted and went and was still responsible with his father's business. There's a lesson to be learned in that. Number five. We are all limited with our time. We must be mindful with our time. Another year has come and gone. We came out of eternity to complete an assignment with a certain period of time. Job says, man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits. He cannot exceed. So look away from him and let him alone till he has put in his time like a hired man, like a steward over our mandate, our purpose. And Dr. Miles Monroe said in the kingdom of God, age is not measured by years, but by assignment. So this is key, knowing your assignment and understanding you are limited in time. So realize one day you will die and work back from there. What is the one thing that you need to do? What is the one thing you need to do to fulfill your purpose, to influence for the kingdom of God? 
narrow it down. Jesus said only a few things in life are necessary. That should take a weight off of you. That should narrow your focus. Start the year focused on what does this look like? Come up with a plan. Number six, exposure. God will never expose you to what you don't understand. So you must invest in yourself. The more you invest in yourself, God will trust you with people. He will bring people across your path. Now, you may not realize this, but Peter was um, a bit racist. <laughs> he wouldn't go through the Samaritan towns. So he could only be exposed to fish. But Paul, Paul was a well-traveled man. He thought globally. He was dual citizenship, actually triple citizenship. He was a Jewish citizen. If you had enough money, you could by your Roman citizenship, and then his citizenship was in heaven. He came from a large multicultural uh, cosmopolitan city of Tarsus. So God was able to use him on a much larger scale. So don't limit yourself. Understand things that we do not live in a vacuum. Think globally. It, go to lunch with people that maybe are outside of your comfort zone, that are from a different culture. Understand why they think the way that they do, why they view life that, the way that they do. And as Jesus, I mean, as Timothy said, study, or Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. So study, learn. Listen, the world is at your fingertips literally through, because of the internet. You can dive in and research and discover and learn. Don't waste your time on social media. Don't waste your time wasting away binge watching shows. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that may not be ashamed. God can trust you with people. So there are some people God doesn't approve. So don't just watch TV and listen to preachers. Listen to men and women of God. Learn and study. Read the Bible for yourself. Now that you have a kingdom perspective, read the gospel seven times this year. God will show you things that you never saw. So watch God expose you to the world and he won't be ashamed of you. He can trust you with it. Next slide, number seven, initiative. Leaders do not wait. We break tradition. Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophy, which depends on human traditions. Jesus had a problem with this also. Why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your traditions? A lot of times we get locked in. This is the way you do things. But as radicals, you break traditions. You break out of the box. Look at things in a different way. Initiate programs in a different way. Think of different ideas. Tradition is a prison. Prison. It locks you in. Tradition can cause you to break the commands of God. We get so, so locked into our cultural traditions, our religious traditions, and even culturally, a lot of times, we tend to be defined or confined by other people's opinions. But we need to take risks, make changes, have initiative. As Nelson Mandela said, action, this is the next slide, Action without vision is only passing time. But vision without action is merely daydreaming. But vision combined with action can change the world. And there is a group of you. You are a community. You are like-minded. You are not alike. You are like-minded, the same thinking, a kingdom mentality. There's power in that, in that community, in where you are. Take advantage of that. 
And women, I want to show you something with this next slide. This was the last year of our King Training Seminar that Dr. Miles did. You will see there's only one woman in this group of men. And only one person through this whole, whole group of people that doesn't have a title. Women, we lead by influence. You don't need a title to give you credibility in the kingdom of God. You may have one and you may need credibility, say for instance, in the healthcare field, to be a doctor, of course, you need a title to give you credibility to be a doctor. But you do not need a title in order to lead, to be a leader. Your power, your silent power is more subtle and potent than position power, which is the power that men operate in. Never negate that. You are like sheep. They should underestimate you as a woman. That's the power and the beauty of being a woman. I used to despise being a woman because in our culture, they're not taken as seriously. And that may be the same in yours, I'm not sure. But I wanted to be taken seriously. I wanted my voice to be heard. And I thought in order to do that, I needed to be a male. And I used to pray to God, you know, take away my emotions. Because, <laughs> you know, in my mind, women are very emotional. <laughs> and now that I understand the power and the function of a woman, I'm like, God, thank you for creating me to be a woman. Now that I understand how I function and I can be in a group of men without a title, not be intimidated because I know who I am. I know my identity. I don't have the need to be, have a title in order to feel the same value as those with a title. I've had people offer me a degree and a doctorate. They've offered that to me because of my experience in uh, hospitality in the hotel industry and being a woman of God. And they said they would give me an honorary doctorate and then I could be titled a doctor. I said, no, thank you. I'm good. I have no need for that, but thank you for the offer. And I declined it because my identity is not in my title. I don't even need a title. My identity is in, I am a son of God and I am a woman of influence. And then secondary to that, I'm a mother, I'm a wife. And those are my responsibilities, my roles. So women, I wanted to throw that in for you. <laughs> Next slide, number eight. I refer to the collective potential of your community. Jesus chose his team and they were described as those who turned the world upside down. That's how you are. I view you as a power team of agents of change in your community. You are radical invaders. You are invading the systems. You are impacting it with the culture of the kingdom. You are bringing solutions to the systems. This is key. And the synergy that you operate in. Synergy is the interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual elements and contributions. That's powerful. The synergy that you operate with as a team, as a group, as a community powerful and I know that's growing and as it grows your influence grows automatically. Next slide number nine take advantage of disadvantages. I put air quotes in disadvantages. I don't consider them disadvantages but the world will. 
the world is supposed to miscalculate you. When he said, you go in like a sheep in the wolf pack, they look at a sheep and their guards go down. They are not offended by a sheep. They, they are not intimidated by a sheep. So their guards should go down. You go in, he gave you the strategy like a sheep, you're not offensive. You have no ulterior motives, but you're shrewd. You're think you're, you're like a snake. Your antennas are up. You're paying attention. You're looking in where you can bring a solution. You're looking where you can plant a seed or a good idea. You're looking where you can bring the culture in to show love, to show kindness to somebody. Jesus made Nazareth famous. There's 11 towns, I mean, I'm sorry, in Nazareth, the archaeologists dug it up and there's 11 homes where Jesus lived and grew up in Nazareth. They go, Nazareth, what good can come from Nazareth? That's just such a little tiny place. It, nothing good can come from Nazareth. They miscalculated Jesus. They said, you're the carpenter's son. Who do you think you are? <laughs> he knew who he was. He says, I am the son of man. I am the son of God. Oh boy, did that get their attention. What? They had no idea who Jesus was. But the beauty is Jesus knew exactly who he was. David versus Goliath. Goliath expected David to come and fight hand-to-hand -hand combat because Goliath had been trained in heavy infantry. This was his expectation to fight like a, a soldier, a Philistine soldier. There's a certain way you fought. But David came from right field from the pastures as an expert slingshot, right? He knew expertly exactly where to throw that stone. And when he did it, it killed him instantly. He didn't need a sword. He didn't need armor. Goliath's guards came down. You see? So they are, So you need to take advantage of what they consider a disadvantage. Our culture may consider a woman a, dis, a disadvantage or minority as a, that's our strength. So your skill is your strength. Every part of who you are is your strength if you understand to view it that way. So the world is supposed to miscalculate you. Next slide. Finally, number 10. To be successful, what is the one thing you were born to do? This is a photo of my father and me as a child. And I went with him everywhere. And we started out in the trailer park. This is what trailers look like in America. And he was building us a pool. So we came from very humble beginnings. Now my father is a multi, 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 multi millionaire with over 33, 33 companies, with over 600 employees. His, I think his, his um, payroll is around 6 million a month, something like that. It's crazy. That's just payroll for his employees. But this is where we came from, digging ditches, digging sprinklers, building pools, living in the trailer park. But he became very focused on the one thing he knew to do was to drill water wells. And now he is the deepest water deep injection driller in the world. And he's not even educated in it. He never went to college. He barely graduated from high school. His reading and writing is not that great. They thought, you know, because, uh, you know, when you, when you confuse your letters a lot, it's a, they call it a disability. But there's other parts of his brain where he's genius, his engineering. He hires engineers from the universities and he out engineers them. He'll tell them, I wanna do this with this machine. And my father has a machine shop and he makes his own everything. My father makes his own equipment. He makes everything. He's a self-contained 
manufacturer of whatever he's doing. It's, he's always doing something. I never, I can't keep up with him. And he's 70 now. And he hires the engineers and he'll go through, he'll have one idea. He'll fixate on this idea. I want this machine to do this. And he'll go through eight engineers that says it can't be done. And it takes him time and thinking and engineering. And then my father does what everybody says he cannot do. He will create a machine that does things the experts can't do in, it, in their schooled engineering. So that's his gift. And it's just natural to him. He thinks his brain like an engineer, mechanical. So he focused on the one thing he had, mechanics, engineering, water well drilling. His dad drilled water wells and he became the best in the world. They hired, they, in the eighties, the Prince of, du of Abu Dhabi, which is in Saudi Arabia, brought him over and wanted him to drill for them. And he said, no. So even the Saudi Arabians sought after my father. We drill oil in, in North Dakota, in America. Now, since the pandemic, everything shut down and this administration doesn't drill for oil anymore. So everything came to a stop. So then he had to reinvent himself in other areas. So you may not be educated in the way that the world has educated, or they may see you as someone uneducationable like they did my father. But there's a gift that God has put in everybody. And the Bible says he never re brings the gift back. He doesn't take the gift. There's a word. I can't. It's, it's given without pro. It starts with a P. He, God never takes a gift away. Once he's given it to somebody, it's there for life. You have to hone in on what that gift is. That one thing. And you will become successful when you focus on this. And Dr. Miles said, if you become successful in an area of your life, you really become influential in all areas of life. That's why the dictator of South Korea invites the basketball player, what's his name? Who's the basketball player? The colored hair. He played with Michael Jordan. You guys are too young. Yes, Dennis Rodman. Thank you. That's why Dennis Rodman can go influence the dictator of South Korea. And I pray to God he influenced him in a good way. <laughs> That's also how we have the, our last president was not a politician, but was a very, very successful businessman. And he became influential in other areas of life. Now, I want to share with you the secret to effective influence. Joseph in Egypt solved a problem that Pharaoh had and he became the vice president. It happened overnight, but he went through the process. So God showed him his vision. The end result, his family, his brothers would be bowing down to him, but God will never show you the process because you will run for the hills. You'll say, I don't want that. Don't sign me up for that. So that's why it's key. You go through the development process to develop character, have scars on your back, learn lessons, be tested. So if you want to make an impact in the world, study a problem in your community and solve one. And the next slide, we're gonna finish with what I call the keys of distinction. Being a kingdom citizen and operating with a culture of heaven automatically makes you distinct. You are automatically set apart. You are automatically not conforming to the standards, the values, the principles of the kingdom of God because they oppose the world's culture. So this organically 
creates a stark contrast. And if you conform, this cancels your identity. When you conform, everyone else will vanish. You vanish just like everybody else. You have just become like all the sheep. And this is what is, this is more, nothing is more dangerous than conformity. And we all know when Paul says, you cannot be conformed to this world systems, but ye be transformed by the renewing of your mindset. So by not conforming, you automatically create conflict. Uh, go skip the next slide and go to one more. So you need to understand that conflict is the only process for identification. I believe crisis comes to purify the gospel. Crisis comes to purify who stands for what. This difference requires and creates conflict in society. So for instance, when fire hits water, this creates conflict and creates steam and a mist is formed. If you put water on fire, it douses the, the water. So differences produce a conflict. This is what will happen in every part of our systems on the, in the world the government, the schools, social media, business, politics, I mean, you name it, the whole thing, sports, healthcare. Your difference will produce a conflict. When Jesus came on the scene, the only conflicts anyone had with him was the religious people. He was a threat to them. And that's what made him stand out. And that's why they crucified him. He says, he's a king. He's not our king. They killed him because he claimed to be the son of God. They could not understand that. This produced conflict. So your difference in standing for morality and the principles of God will create a conflict. We are seeing it happen with the... Um, uh, curriculums that they are developing here and in Japan and maybe other places, I, I don't know, but that's where I know it's happening. It is producing conflicts. From the, what they are teaching our children does not line up with the standards of God. And our voices are being heard. We are not okay with this. They are indoctrinating our children. So unity requires diversity. If you are unified, as you are, say in your community, even now, but each, all of you are different, right? You have different giftings, different personalities. So you are not unified because you're the same. If that's the case, there's no need for unity. So for instance, the United Nations, that implies everyone is different but their definition is changing. What they're really saying is one nation, conform or leave, forget your identity. But your identity is very important. So we must check the ideology of other nations. We must keep our own. For if we conform, we vanish. The two things that are alike cannot unify. This is why a male and a male cannot unify. And a female and a female cannot unify. Your differences produce power. Fire produces steam because they conflict. Conflict happened when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied the king's orders. And it changed. Nebuchadnezzar's mind. And they said, we must worship your God. They've never seen anything like this. How can these men go in this fire and not be burned? And then we saw a fourth man. Who's that fourth man in there? And they came out and it said, not even a piece of material was singed. 
Their clothes were not even singed. Your differences produce power. So protect your differences. Do not conform. Don't change them. Otherwise you are canceling yourself. And then the next slide, we cannot compare ourselves to anyone or one another. Who you are and where you have been uniquely qualify you for your own definition of success according to your assignment. Again, you can only compare yourself by the progress of your vision. And this is key. So don't compare yourself to anybody. Everybody has a different assignment and everybody has a different ability. Jesus was very clear with the parable of the talents. He gave everybody money according to their ability. And then he watched how they managed it. So that's why we cannot compare ourselves to others. And then the next scripture, I have to throw this in. This is one of my favorites where Jesus says, Father, I have brought you glory by completing the work that you gave me to do. We all have work to do as an influencer and I will recap them here on the next slide. Be genuine. Operate with your vision and initiate it. Cultivate relationships. Hone your gift as a gift specialist. This will attract people. Understand your time is limited. I had to ask God during this fast. I said, God, you have to lengthen my days. That's a scripture that David wrote in, in Psalms. And it's where you get more done in your day. Because our time is so limited. There's not enough time in the days. Number six, exposure. We covered that. Number seven, having initiative. Number eight, collective potential as a community. Number nine, take advantage of what the world considers your disadvantages. And number 10, the keys to being a successful, solving problems, um, becoming a master of your gift. And then finally, I'd leave this with you. Influence is a natural process. Once you have discovered yourself and become who God created you to be, and you manifest your true self, God will open doors. He will trust you with people. He can bring people across your path because you have pure motives. You're just in it to influence them for God in the right timing, but first and foremost, to be their friend. Well, Watch God will trust you with resources and people because those are the greatest commodities I believe we have is time, people, resources. So influence is natural. It should be a natural manifestation of the culture of God in you because God, his goal is to influence the culture of heaven here on earth through you, according to your gifting in the system that he sent you to manifest in. So thank you all. My time is up. I've completed two sessions today. I pray that the beginning of this year that you have garnered keys to bring you forward and to refine your focus in advancing the kingdom of God. You are a precious community. I thank God for Pastor Roy and Rochelle. You are sent from God. You have done the hard work of transforming and renewing your mindset. And now you are empowering others to do the same. So my prayers are with you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us, that you lead and guide us, and that you give us wisdom, and that we are shrewd. You gave us the strategy for shrewdness to go in like sheep but we are shrewd like the wolf, I mean, like the snake amongst wolves. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are a paraclete, our assistant. You are there to bring all things to our remembrance. We will be responsible for what you have given us stewardship over. And Father, we repent for not being good stewards, perhaps in the past, but from this day forward, we will accomplish what you have sent us here to do and be an influencer for your kingdom and for your glory so that your nature and your culture 
and your character is reflected through us, your ambassadors. We love you, Father. We thank you that your kingdom come here on earth, just as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.